One of the things uh, I really like is, is a parade. And we have a great parade here in Centralia at, at the Halloween time. And we have a stand right across the post office. And we have all kinds of hot chocolate and cookies and goodies uh, for sale. And the people come by. And then we watch the parade. And, and people, when they come by on the parade, some of them are our people. It might be our kid in the band. We we'll wave and shout. And sometimes one of our church families being honored. And again, we like to wave and cheer them on. And uh, sometimes we have a display. And one year, like we won a trophy, times of great glory for the Presbyterian past. And, uh, and so it's all great with the parade. We've had great national and international parades. One of the famous parades was when our GIs were coming into Paris, showing that Paris was free from Nazi rule. And that was a great parade. Or after World War II, we had a great parade in New York City. And there's something about a celebration. But I want to tell you about the oldest running parade. And the parade has two parts. The first part is based in the Passover meal. And the Passover meal comes when the Israelites were in Egypt. The, they wouldn't let the, the slaves, the Israelites were slaves, they wouldn't let them go. So um, God had the angel of death pass over Egypt, and the firstborn of the Egyptians uh, was killed. And in the great confusion, afterwards, the Israelis made their escape. You might remember that Moses had to part the sea of reeds and get them off into the wilderness away from uh, Pharaoh's chariots that were chasing behind. Now, when they, to commemorate that, they had a great feast. And, and this is what they would do. If you were Jewish and you were in Spain, you would have your table, there'd be at least 10 people at your table, you'd have one empty chair. The empty chair and the place setting with a little goblet of wine is for the prophet Elijah. And that was to announce that Elijah might become and announce that the Messiah is here. Now, we believe that Elijah was John the Baptist. But when I had a uh, Passover feast here in town with a Jewish family, they had the empty seat with a little goblet of wine for Elijah. And if we were in Spain, if we were in North Africa, if, if we were uh, in Greece and we were Jewish or in Rome, we would say at the end of the meal, next year, Jerusalem. And then the next year, we do the same thing. And if I was the Jewish uh, head of the house, I would say, next year, Jerusalem. And after 30 times of my saying it, Dan Kingery would say, when's he going to go? <laughs> And finally, I said, I can do it. I saved up my money. I'm going to make that pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And the city would get packed. There'd be over a million people there. And I would be coming. And as I came, I would be uh, sold palms. The, the business people were very smart, just like we are at our parade. They'd have things for sale to buy, palms or food. And there's a long, long line as hundreds of thousands of people are coming into the city. And this is what would happen as I come into the city. I would come up and I would know Psalm 118 by heart. And it's very important that I did because this is what people would say as they entered the temple. And as I am marching up with this huge crowd, we're marching up, and there's people watching on both sides. They're all waving palms. I got a palm. And I would say, as I march up, and I'm singing this, like the choir, open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. And there's a thousands of us saying it at the same time. What a, a roar that would be. And then the people on the sides are saying, this is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. Then my crowd would say, as we keep marching up, I thank you that you have entered me and have become my salvation. And it goes on to say, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And the people on the sides would say this, what we open our worship with. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And then we would say, save us, we pray, and the word is Hosanna. Hosanna means save us. Hosanna, save us, we pray. 
oh Lord, give us success. We're coming in. So I come into the temple. I'm walking around. I am dazzled. There is gold all over the walls of the temple. That sun, we're on the mountaintop, and the sun is shining on it, and I'm blinded by all the marble and the gold, and I, it's wonderful. And I check everything out, and after a couple days, I join the outside, but now I'm a bystander, and I'm welcoming the other pilgrims coming in. And I'm doing the same words of Psalm 118, and they're entering, and I'm cheering them on. It's a wonderful parade, and Jesus has an issue now. It's dangerous in Judea. The disciples did not want to go to Bethany uh, with Jesus because they knew the people in Judea wanted to kill Jesus. Now, is Jesus going to hide and come in in a secret way? Or is he going to make a bold statement? And Jesus has a plan. And his plan was this. He had a secret code word, and there was a donkey at one of the places there in Bethany, and the code word, because he wanted to keep it secret, he didn't want the word to get out, that two of the disciples would go. He said, go to this house, you'll see a donkey tied up. Untie the donkey. It looks like he's stealing it. Untie the donkey. And people were coming up. Why are you taking this donkey? And your code word is, the Lord has need of it. Okay. He gets the donkey. Now, the donkey always impressed me. When I was a kid, and my dad was pastor of the Coatesville Presbyterian Church, we had a softball team. They had their own uniforms. And it was a glorious day if we could beat the Baptist church. We, and, and often they won. But what they would do for fun sometimes, they'd bring donkeys in this professional outfit. There were so many church softball leagues. They had donkey ball where the people had to get on a donkey. You hit the ball, get on the donkey, and try to get that donkey to go to first base. And we in the crowd would just laugh. Well, I made a mistake one year. It was about 35 years ago when I had more hair, I had a mustache, I looked a lot younger, and I had taken the youth group of the Galesburg Church to Honey Rock Camp. It's a, owned by Wheaton College, and they had donkeys there. And we were doing, this is winter time, and we were doing ice hockey and things like that, broom ball, having a wonderful time with the snow and snowballs. And one of the kids said, Pastor Ed, I dare you to get on a donkey. Now, when anybody ever dares you, it's usually a bad sign. Very rarely do you do a dare and you realize it was a good idea afterwards. It's just a bad idea. And so, wanting to show the kids I was youthful and vibrant, I got on the donkey. Boy, this isn't so bad. No wonder Jesus could ride a donkey into town. I'm enjoying the donkey. All of a sudden, there in that uh, field, I find myself levitating. Now, when you levitate, it means you're not perpendicular, you're horizontal. I was horizontal in the air, and I said, uh-oh, <laughs> oh, really? And the kids are, and all of a sudden, I fell horizontally. And when I hit that ice, I'm going, oh, no. And I had to, I, I honestly, I waited about 30 seconds before I tried to wiggle my fingers and toes. I wasn't sure I hadn't broken anything, and fortunately I could move. But I had a new appreciation for Jesus taking that donkey, and when he came in, when he was coming in, people were very excited. Now, they're excited for several reasons. When he had fed the 5,000, he had the men um, sit in 100 groups of 50, and one of the people said the miracle was not the bread, but that Jesus got men to follow directions and sit in groups of 50. But when they saw a hundred groups of 50 men, it reminded them of a military legion. The Romans had 2,000 soldiers in Palestine. They were based in Caesarea uh, on the Mediterranean Sea. For holy days, they come to Jerusalem, keep order. Jesus had more. And that was just from one section around the Sea of Galilee. So they knew he could raise a lot of men. He could beat Rome 
for a while. And they wanted to be free from Rome. The palm was on the coins in the temple. That's why they changed the coins from Caesar coins. You couldn't bring Caesar's image into the temple. You put a palm that was on that coin, and it meant a liberated Palestine, a liberated Israel. They are looking for liberation to reestablish the kingdom of David. Now, they also knew that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and they knew that he had healed a blind man at the pool of Siloam. So they're very, very excited about this Jesus. He might be the one to free them from Rome, and they're cheering him on. So when they say, Hosanna, save now, not like us asking for salvation. They were looking for salvation from Rome, and Jesus had a different salvation in mind. And they put their coats on the road. They put their palms on the road. They were waving them, and somehow Jesus kept that donkey under control. And people had different responses. The, the people were excited. They were enthusiastic. And there was such a roar outside of, the, of the Jerusalem that people inside Jerusalem said, what's happening? What's going on? And the answer was, Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet, is here. They didn't have the whole picture of the Son of God. It, for them, it was a prophet. You also had the backers. You also had the high priest. And they're saying, this is dangerous. And Caiaphas, the high priest, said, we got to kill one man to save this nation from rising up against Rome because Rome will just kill us. And 30-some years later, they did that. The Israelis went down to Caesarea, killed every Roman soldier, and the Romans came back with Titus leading them and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And I had the privilege of going to Jerusalem, and the Romans left the great side wall of the temple, huge blocks. They call it the Wailing Wall, where you put your prayers in, in, the, in the cracks of, of the wall there, but they left the wall there to show if we could conquer this, we can conquer anything. And the response of the soldiers would be, let them try something, we'll take care of it. And the question for us is, Jesus is saying this, as he comes down that parade, he's saying to us, Ed, get behind from behind that food stand and join me in the walk. Join me in the parade. He is saying to you, join me in the parade. Follow me. Follow me. I will give you the life. It's called enios. Eternal life means a quality of life today and then life without end. You get the quality of life of God today. And what's that quality? What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love. If I follow Jesus, and if I believe Jesus, I trust that that love just washes over me. I could call God as my heavenly parent, as our Father who art in heaven. I'm loved, I'm cherished. That love comes across me. And if I let that love in, and the love's already in us, now my job is to let the love out. If I let the love out, what happens? Joy. Jesus says, I want my joy to be in you. So we let the joy out, and then the peace. But if I'm not very loving, I'm not going to find the peace. I did not understand that as a youth. Jesus, I want peace, but I'm still angry and provoked at a bunch of these people. My teenage friends, or the teachers, or whoever it was, I want peace. And I didn't get it, because the love comes first. And so if I'm agreeing to follow Jesus in this parade, it means I'm going to let Jesus guide me, coach me, and teach me. And the very first thing Jesus says, we do this on Monday, Thursday, a new commandment I give you, not to love the others like you love yourself, but to love the others like I, Jesus, am loving you. I want to close with my favorite illustration of a parade, and I shared it before, but Christine just deserves so much what she had gone through in life. And remember the polio years? I remember my mom 
keeping me in the backyard. I want to go out and play with other kids. Stay in the backyard, little Eddie. Well, it was the polio years I figured out later. She was trying to, you know, reduce the chances of that awful disease. Well, Christine had gotten polio. And I'm going to talk to you just about that parade. It's a graduation parade. It's a wonderful parade. And, you know, there's honors given out. There's all these great people, the academic honors, the athletic honors. Anyway, the pastor, and my dad gave me this book. I just really appreciate it. The pastor was going to give a talk at that parade. Probably this is around 1950 or so. And the parade, the processional of the graduates in that high school was going slow, 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 slow. Why is this going so slow? Wondering. He's puzzled. It went very, very slow. All of a sudden, he saw at the door, at the end of the long aisle, a wisp of a girl. She was walking with much difficulty. Every step jarred her entire body. Now, the reason I'm sharing this is that she's in a parade, too, just like you and I are in the parade. It jarred her whole body. Then I realized she was braced with iron from her head to her heels, and I realized another thing which gave me a thrill. The speed of the procession was time to make it easy for her. Halfway down the aisle, her cap jarred down over her eyes, and I saw her smilingly nudge the big 200-pound boy who was marching with her with an answering smile, he adjusted her cap because her own arms couldn't go up to reach it. When the time came, the principal conferred the honors, all but one, for at the close of the presentations, he said, there's one more medal given by the students. <laughs> and the, it will be presented by the captain of the football team who had walked her down. And the boy said something like this. This is the biggest medal I ever saw because everyone in the school wanted to have a part in buying it, but it isn't big enough to express our gratitude to this young lady. On one side of it is her name, Christine. On the other side is her pet name for her, Miss Inspiration. Wow. Through the years of school, like she has worn iron braces and suffered continually, but no hardship has ever been enough to wipe the smile off her face. Sometimes when the going has gotten rough for us on the athletic field or somewhere else, someone invariably would mention her name and we would just grin and buckle down. Yeah. You ever ask a stupid question? The pastor goes up to her after church and says, Christine, can I ask you a question? Are you a Christian? <laughs> and she said, how could anybody not be a Christian? I, I wasn't half of what that boy said about me, but yes, I'm a Christian. And that's our walk. Whatever the walk is in our life, how tough it gets to add to our joy, to good moments, and for the tough times, our job is to follow Jesus and know that Jesus' love, no matter what, has the possibility of shining through us to others. And Jesus' light shines through you so well. Amen.